Hello, beautiful people. Today we are going to examine Pandora's box opened. Uh, we will look at the beginnings of religious war um, in Reformation Europe. Many of the things that we're going to look at today in and in future lessons will will shape modern day Europe and in some ways uh, the modern world. So it's 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 quite fascinating. Let us begin. We are back in Europe. We are back in Europe in a post-Reformation Europe, a post-Reformation Europe with the Ottoman Turks pushing in from the east. And what follows the European Reformations um, is a time of tremendous turmoil and change as the continent moves towards uh, the modern era. Now, before we commence with the Reformation and the Reformation Wars, um, I think it's important for modern audiences to examine what are the fundamental differences between the Roman Catholic Church and these Protestant churches that are emerging? What are the fundamental differences? In many ways, I think it's, it's a good thing that so many of us don't really know the differences now because in the 15 and 1600s these differences would get you killed and the fact that modern western audiences probably couldn't list five fundamental differences between protestant denominations and the roman catholic church in many ways speaks to a how secular how non-religious the west has become but two how unimportant these things appear now. Just know that these differences had millions of people killed. Let's look at some of the big differences. Uh, the greatest, probably the greatest difference between the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant churches of this time, and again, we're going back to the 1500s, um, would be the Pope. The Pope. Um, Catholics have a Pope, the Bishop of Rome. Uh, they consider him the Vicar of Christ. Um, he is uh, uh, unfailing, unfailing, infallible. Uh, he doesn't make mistakes. Um, he heads the church. He heads the church. And what he says are the words of God. He, he, he speaks on behalf of God. Uh, for the Protestants, um, no human is infallible. And uh, uh, Jesus alone is the head of the Christian church. That is a fundamental difference between the Roman Catholic Church and Protestants um, during this time. And again, don't think of Catholicism uh, now. We've, we've seen a lot of uh, reformation within the Catholic Church over the last 400 years. We're going back. We're going back. What else are the fundamental differences between Protestantism and Catholicism? Well, the Catholics have a complex ritual, a complex ritual uh, in many ways held over from the Roman pagan days. Um, Protestants, for the most part, do not. There is no incense burning, the candles, etc. Uh, the ceremony and ritual of the Catholic Church, um, which is one of the most attractive things about the Catholic Church. Protestants shun them for the most part. What about the saints? Well, Protestants certainly uh, recognize the saints. However, however, they acknowledge them. They don't pray to them. Uh, Roman Catholics uh, uh, pray to the saints. Holy water. Catholics have holy water. Protestants do not. What else do we have? Well, uh, the celibacy of the priesthood. Under Roman Catholicism, priests are to remain celibate. Um, if Protestant denominations do have priests, they are certainly allowed to marry and have children. Nuns. Nuns are a Roman Catholic uh, institution not found in uh, Protestant denominations. Purgatory. This central argument between uh, Luther and the Catholic Church over uh, 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 indulgences and purgatory. Um, Catholics believe in purgatory. Uh, for the most part, Protestants do not. On to scripture. Now, for this is this is fundamental. For Protestants, scripture, the Bible, 
is the uh, be all end all for Protestants. It's the word of God. Now, Catholics certainly recognize the Bible. Of course they do, but they also understand that tradition and, 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 and church decisions uh, 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 made by popes and councils, etc., are just as important as scripture. And so church theology, as well as scripture, co-rule the church, whereas in Protestantism, uh, the scripture is the be-all and all. When it comes to scripture, Catholics believe, Catholics believe that um, only the Roman Catholic Church has authority to, to interpret the Bible, whereas Protestants believe that each individual has the authority to read and understand and interpret Scripture, which will open up a, a, a number of issues um, in the upcoming uh, century. When it comes to education, Catholic children receive catechism, um, education on, on church belief, church theology, etc., whereas Protestant children um, read the Bible and receive their uh, education through the reading of Scripture. When it comes to the sacraments, Catholics have seven sacraments, seven sacraments, baptism, confirmation, the Eucharist, penance, uh, anointing of the sick, holy orders, and matrimony, whereas the Lutherans and Calvinists have two, baptism and the Eucharist. When it comes to salvation, this was another one of Luther's uh, central issues. When it comes to salvation, Catholics believe that good works and faith will allow you to re, uh, receive salvation, whereas Protestants teach that you receive salvation through God's grace alone. Fundamental uh, difference there. And then finally, communion. Catholics teach that the bread and wine become the body and blood of Jesus Christ, uh, meaning that Jesus Christ is truly present in uh, the Eucharist, the altar. Uh, Protestantism uh, can differ on this, whether it's the essence or symbolic, um, but they don't uh, teach that these are the literal transformations of, 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 of Jesus's blood and flesh um, on the altar. Fundamental differences. And again, it's a sign that the wars of religion that we're going to look at uh, pushed many Europeans past these arguments, but these were fundamental arguments and fundamental changes, uh, differences uh, in the 1500s. Now, Pandora's box. Pandora's box is a part of classical Greek mythology. Pandora was said to have been the first woman on earth, uh, and she was given everything by the gods. Uh, she was given a beautiful jar, um, not a box, uh, although it's taught differently, um, with instructions not to open it under any circumstances. You have the world. Don't open up this box or jar. Well, overcome by curiosity, uh, she opens it. She opens it and then very quickly realizes what she had done and closes it back up. But it was too late. It was too late. Pandora's box had been opened, and what came out of this box was all of the evil of the world. Um, if you see a parallel between Pandora and Eve, you're not off. You're not off. And it's very interesting, isn't it, how both of these ancient societies, uh, the Greeks and the Hebrews, blamed a woman for all of the evil in the world and how evil is associated with knowledge. No one ever thought that the Bible was evil. I'm not trying to make that connection. What I'm trying to tell you is that church fathers, most church fathers believe that in the Bible were very complex arguments, very open to interpretation, and that these need to be guarded. These need to be guarded. They need to be interpreted and then given to the people. You can't just give a man a Bible. You just can't. You can't allow him to or her uh, to interpret things for themselves because, again, and I've made the connection to Atomic Secrets, 
These are very, very, very uh, 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 critical ideas, critical matters, important, complex, and given to the people openly, uh, then you are opening Pandora's box. If every man is a priest and every man is able to interpret the Bible, how many more ideas are going to come forward? How many men are going to come forward and call themselves prophets and lead uh, Christ's children to ruin? These are the arguments made by the church. If you allow this, we will see war, we will see destruction, and we will see the loss of untold souls. These are the arguments made by church fathers. And in many ways, the late 1500s, 1600s proved the church correct. We are going to unleash absolute chaos across Europe now that the Bible is open to interpretation by so many lay people, so many people like you and I. The German Reformation and war. Now, we've looked at the German Reformation, and we've looked briefly at at least one war, the Peasants' Revolt, that came out uh, because of this Reformation. Luther emerges at the right time, and he prints, he uh, 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 allows German peasants and German nobility to read the Old and New Testament, and it does unleash tremendous chaos and turmoil. The spread of Lutheranism. We saw in a previous lesson how Lutheranism becomes incredibly popular in the nor uh, northern German states. Remember, pardon me, that Luther is speaking within the Holy Roman Empire, which is made up of hundreds of principalities, free cities, dukedoms, um, overseen by a Holy Roman Emperor who is elected by uh, the electors of the empire. Lutheranism spreads to northern Germany and Scandinavia. It's here that princes and dukes don't feel that they are listened to as much um, in Rome by, say, Italian princes, Spanish kings. The farther you get from Rome, the more likely you are to be attracted to Protestantism. Please make a note of this. Converting to Protestantism was one part Spiritual, certainly being able to read the Bible in your own language, hearing sermons in your own language, something that the Catholics won't do until the 1960s, have mass in the vernacular language. Certainly, that's part of it, certainly. But it's also very political. If you break from the Catholic Church, you no longer have to listen to bishops or popes. You no longer have to send them money. Um, so please know, please know, the farther you move from Rome, the more likely you as a leader of your domain, whether it be a city or a kingdom, you're more likely to convert to Lutheranism. As Luther's message spreads, as more and more uh, regular lay people, not members of the clergy, read and interpret the Bible for themselves, chaos and war spread throughout. The Knights' Revolt was a perfect example of this uh, a Pandora's box bringing pain and suffering to the European continent. Knights are in a very strange position by the 1500s. They see a world changing. They see a world changing. The economy is changing. The military is changing. The world is literally changing. And inspired in part, in part by uh, 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 the Bible, but also because of real economic and political issues, uh, knights in the German states of the Holy Roman Empire gather around this man, Franz von Sickingen, butchered it, um, and they revolt. They revolt. Why do these knights revolt? Well, it's one part the message of Luther, uh, but it's also because feudalism is breaking down. Knights are tied to the land. Knights derive their uh, power and their authority from their land. This is the way it's been for a thousand years since the fall of Rome. Feudalism is beginning to break down. They are no longer, they are no longer enjoying the same role, the same status that they once had. And so the Knights of Germany revolt. 
It's a mass revolt um, against the Holy Roman Empire. They are also Protestant. Please keep that in mind. That is also a part of this. But remember, the Reformation is just as political as it is spiritual. You see, by the 1500s, it's a new economy. It's a new economy, an economy, by the way, that the landed gentry are not allowed to partake in. They are tied to the land. We see the rise of cities. We see the rise of a merchant class. We see that the new power comes from banking. It comes from trade, from commerce. It doesn't come from the battlefield any longer. Furthermore, kings always nervous about the power of their nobility, increasingly choose for their top advisors and the top jobs, new men, men who are educated, but not necessarily noble. Um, they do this to protect themselves against the power of the nobility, but the, 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 the nobility, the knights see this and they are not again, enjoying the status they once had. Furthermore, militaries are changing in the 15 and 1600s. We see the birth of national armies. We see the birth of the king's infantry. These men are loyal to the king, not their local lord. No longer do the knights enjoy being able to lead their own armies um, in the battlefield. We now have cheap guns given to peasants that can bring a knight down. A knight in the 12 and 1300s was the equivalent of an, uh, 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 an F-16 pilot, unmatched, unmatched. He would have ridden over the infantry made up of peasants with their uh, pitchforks. But now a cheap gun can be given to a 12-year-old peasant, and he could bring down knights all day. And the kings are arming their own armies. The knight's status has greatly been reduced. Furthermore, kings are seeking more power. They're seeking more power. By the 1600s, 1700s, we will have kings in Europe claiming absolute power, absolute rule. Increasingly, they are moving away from common law towards Roman law, which gives these rulers much more power. By the time we get to the 1600s, we will see the uh, emergence of absolutism, kings ruling as, as close to gods as you can possibly get. The knights see this. They see what's happening. And just know that the knights' revolt will fail. Luther, by the way, comes out against it. Uh, one, because he knew it was going to fail. And two, um, he has to remain political. And, 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 and he knew where his bread was buttered. And so he does not support the Knights revolt. But this is just one example of all of this turmoil that is coming to the German states, the Holy Roman Empire. And I apologize, I'm using both interchangeably. The Holy Roman Empire also includes not only the German states, but Switzerland, Northern Italy, but I'm using them interchangeably. I do apologize. Next, the Peasants' Revolt. We looked at the Peasants' Revolt. Inspired by the reading of the Bible, uh, hundreds of thousands of peasants revolt across the Holy Roman Empire, bringing uh, absolute chaos to the realm, uh, burning nobles' homes, properties. Luther will come out against this as well, and it will be severely, severely put down. But again, Catholic ministers are looking at all of this and saying, I told you. I told you, I told you, you can't open Pandora's box and expect to put this back in. This will bring chaos. This will bring death to uh, Christendom, the, the, the continent of Europe. The Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, attempts to bring stability and unity to the Holy Roman Empire. He is dealing with Luther. He is dealing with the Turks. He wants order. He wants order. He wants an end to these revolts. He wants an end to uh, 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 the death and destruction that the Reformation is bringing. He calls for a meeting. He calls for a meeting between Lutherans and Catholics to discuss their differences and unite. Let's unite once again, because our real enemy, by the way, are the Turks. They're at the gates of Vienna. Something needs to be done. 
something needs to be done. Suleiman the Magnificent is literally breathing down our backs. We need unity. We need unity. Let me just tell you that that doesn't happen. It does not happen at the first Diet of Augsburg. Um, the emperor attempted to put a deadline on these Lutheran principalities within his realm. Remember, he's dealing with uh, Protestants within his own kingdom, the Holy Roman Empire. He puts a deadline on them uh, coming back to the true fold of Catholicism. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, and those Ottomans are still coming in from the east. This is Augsburg, the center of this great meeting. What do the Protestants do instead? They form a league. They form a league headed by Philip I of Hesse and John Frederick of Saxony, where Luther is from, called the Schmalkaldic League. The Schmalkaldic League. This was a mutual defense alliance made up of Protestant princes um, within the Holy Roman Empire. Now, Luther supports this, of course. Um, the Holy Roman Emperor is busy. The Holy Roman Emperor is busy. And so this league is allowed to exist. By the way, France, the France, Francis the first of France and Suleiman the Magnificent also support this league being established because they, they are, those are two enemies of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. And they've surrounded him through an alliance themselves. Just know it's too late. It's too late to uh, force these Lutherans to come back to the fold. And Charles V is too weakened by the Turks and France's um, aggressions to crush this league like he could have centuries before. It is during all of this, it is during all of this chaos that we have a very strange thing occur in the city of Munster, in the city of Munster, modern day northern germany in munster in munster there is a group of radical protestants a splinter of the anabaptist movement that take over the city of munster this is the one thing that unites the catholics and the protestants just so you know this will be the one thing during this time that unites the catholics and the protestants now who takes over the city of munster the anabaptists anabaptism again this is what happens when you allow everyday people to read and interpret the bible for themselves Anabaptists believed in something outrageous. First of all, they're pacifists. Right there, ridiculous. They say, well, it says in the Bible. It says in the Bible, Jesus told us to be pacifists. That's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Why do they get their name Anabaptists? Well, they believed in uh, adult baptism. They believed that you should be able to make up your own mind when it came to you coming to Christ through baptism. Um, they read their Bible. They get these crazy ideas. Anna means re. Everyone was baptized in 1500s Europe. And so if you were an adult who was baptized, you were being baptized again, right? Um, we don't, modern day, most of us, I would assume, don't have a large issue with adult baptism. This could get you killed. This could get you killed. Furthermore, if you're not allowing your children to be baptized, if they die, they're going to spend eternity in hell. You are literally damning an entire generation of Christ's children to damnation. This is the uh, uh, belief that other people uh, uh, have when they look at these um, adult uh, Baptists, I guess, not related to the Baptist church. Um, these Anabaptists take over this German city of Munster. They take it over. They expel all the non-believers. They expel Catholics and Lutherans alike, and they are going to form a new society. They're going to show the world, like Florence under Savonarola, um, a new Jerusalem, a new Jerusalem, a Zion, a Zion. We are going to create a city of God. Jan van Leiden takes over as the leader of the Anabaptists. And he, along with his top uh, associates, begin to reform the city. 
they are creating a city of God. And again, why not? I read the Bible. God speaks to me. Did God not speak to other people in the Bible? Did God not speak to other prophets? Why not me? Why not me? Again, there's the danger. There's the danger of allowing this uh, a Bible to be read by the masses. Now, the Catholic Church wasn't entirely against printing of the Bible in different languages. What their fear was, was it being accessible to anyone. That's the danger. What war were some of the reforms made by Van Leiden um, in the city of Munster? By the way, by the time these reforms come, the city is under siege. It is surrounded by both Catholics and Lutherans um, who are trying to bring this city down. So they're already a city under siege. They're surrounded. They're behind their walls, and they begin to reform themselves. Well, the first thing they do is they proclaim von Leiden as the new David. He is the new King David. Um, he adopts kingly regalia. He dresses as a king. He is the king of Munster now. Um, he rules absolutely. He Did David not rule absolutely with God? Did David not uh, 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 dress in beautiful garb? Um, he also, interestingly enough, legalizes polygamy. He legalizes polygamy. He himself will take 16 wives. Um, children in Munster are encouraged to rat out their parents. If your parents aren't true believers, tell the church authorities. Tell the church authorities. Uh, doors have to remain open. There's no secrets in this new Zion. Um, property could be seized. Very quickly, Munster becomes something resembling a police state. At the same time that all of these uh, restrictions and reforms are being passed, starvation kicks in. The city is being sieged. It's surrounded by the Catholics and the Lutherans. Um, people begin to starve in the city of Munster. There are reports of the citizens eating rats, dogs, um, boiling grass just to get something in their stomach, uh, 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 boiled leather, just the taste of something resembling food. Um, there are even cases of them digging up recently, uh, 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 the recent dead, just to survive just to survive. Well, after a siege, after a siege of many, many, many months, the walls are opened up. The walls are opened up. And the Catholics and Lutherans butcher the citizens of Munster. By this time, um, everyone who wasn't a Anabaptist had already left or been kicked out. Many, many, many thousands of Anabaptists were butchered. What about the leaders? What about Van Leiden and the leaders? Well, his two top officials and himself were in the town square, tortured in front of thousands. Absolutely brutal. Absolutely brutal. They are chained to stakes in the Munster public square. Uh, their flesh is torn uh, with 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 flesh ripping tongs that they've placed in the fire, so they wait till they get white hot, and they literally tear the flesh off of them. Um, as if they pass out, they are ha they have water poured on them. Uh, they're woken back up uh, and tortured more, um, and they they take turns torturing them. Um, so they all get to witness uh, the, these three men, including Van Leiden, uh, each other's demise, and in the end. They have daggers plunged into their chest. Their bodies are then placed in iron cages and put atop the uh, cathedral as warnings, as warnings to anyone who enters the city of Munster. This is how we deal with men and women who try to establish a new Zion, who turn their backs on the teachings of Christ. Those cages are still there. The bodies have since been removed, although they were there for many, many, many decades. Their bones were there, picked apart by birds of prey and other beasts. Um, and to this day, if you visit the city of Munster, those cages are still there. 
as reminders. This is what happens. This is what happens. Um, just so you know, Anabaptists were continually uh, persecuted in Europe um, over the next century, uh, both uh, uh, Lutherans and Catholics uh, uh, persecuted the Anabaptists, tortured, hunted down, killed, flogged, you name it. This is the one thing that can unite the uh, Protestants and the uh, uh, Catholics, these radical, radical Protestants. Now, that's too much. I can, I can talk to a Lutheranist, but I can't abide an Anabaptist. Now, the Anabaptists uh, will be persecuted, like I said, for the next century. Um, many of them, by the way, will find uh, a, a refuge in the growing colonies that England has established on the uh, eastern seaboard of the New World, um, especially in places like Pennsylvania. The Anabaptists will themselves evolve and splinter off into various groups, including the Mennonites, uh, the Amish. And so when you see uh, uh, the Reform Brethren, when you see these groups, um, and they're all across the United States, know that these are the descendants of the Anabaptists. Refugees, political refugees of the 16 and 1700s. Once Charles V no longer has to worry about the Turks, he turns his attention on the Schmalkaldic League and he goes to war with them. He goes to war with them. Luther is dead. He's made peace with France. In the end, this league is defeated. This league is defeated by the Holy Roman Emperor. What do we get out of this? In the aftermath, in the aftermath, Charles realizes it's too late to force conversion. It is too late to force conversion. It's been too long. It's been too long. And so, and so we get something resembling toleration for its time resembling religious toleration this is charles's uh after his victory over the league he wants to turn back the clock he can't he can't and so do we get we get the peace of augsburg the peace of augsburg charles calls for another meeting another meeting between the catholics and the protestant princes of his empire. Regular people aren't invited, but the leaders of these domains are invited. He needs peace, enough fighting. In the end, in the end, they settle on something. The prince or king or duke, the leader of their own domain gets to choose whether it's going to be Protestant or Catholic. If you are a Protestant in Catholic lands, you need to leave. If you are a Catholic in Protestant lands, you need to leave. We'll give you enough time. You can sell your stuff. But the Peace of Augsburg allows the ruler of their particular domain to decide whether it's going to be Protestant or Catholic. Whose realm? His religion. This is what we get at the Peace of Augsburg. What we get from the Peace of Augsburg is approximately 60 years of peace to the German states. For 60 years, for 60 years, we get, for the most part, peace. Now, the Peace of Augsburg makes no mention of Calvinists. It makes no mention of Anabaptists. These two groups will continue to be persecuted by both groups. Just know um, that's going to lead to future trouble. There's no mention of Calvinists in this, um, but for the most part, it brings peace. It brings peace. This is a religious map. This is a religious map in 1500s Holy Roman Empire. We can see Lutherans. We can see Catholics, but we also see Calvinists, Zwingliists, um, Anabaptists. This isn't enough. This isn't enough. The German states, the Holy Roman Empire, is going to see more bloodshed, much worse. But for the time being, for the time being, it brings peace 
to the Holy Roman Empire. Now, let's quickly look at the Swiss Reformation and war. We've seen the Swiss Reformation. Switzerland itself is a semi-independent uh, 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 nation within the Holy Roman Empire. And like the German states, the Swiss Confederacy, as it was known, um, underwent its own reformation, initially under that man, Jurek Zwingli. Jurek Zwingli attempted to create a Protestant New Jerusalem. Um, it spreads to parts of Switzerland. Switzerland is never fully Protestant. It In the cities, it goes uh, a Protestant. In the countryside, it remains Catholic. And this will lead to war. This will lead to war. The Protestants attempting to create a new Jerusalem themselves um, in Zurich will destroy uh, 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 churches, cathedrals, burning of the saints, breaking of the stained glass, etc. The Confederacy is at war with itself between Catholic and Protestant uh, 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 states within the Confederacy. It was in the Second War of Capel. In the Second War of Capel, that where Zingli, for the record, dies, that we see a sort of peace. We see a sort of peace. We see a religious settlement that allows these Swiss states within the Confederacy to decide for themselves whether they are going to be Catholic or Protestant. Catholic or Protestant. In the Catholic states, Protestantism is illegal. So is, by the way, um, the teaching of Greek and Latin, because we don't want these humanists uh, reading all of these old texts and, 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 and making trouble. In the Protestant states, Catholicism is banned. Again, is it toleration? Well, for the 1500s, yeah, yeah, it's a form of toleration. At least we're not killing each other. At least we're not killing each other. This is the division of the old Swiss Confederacy between blue Catholic and uh, yellow Protestant. We're seeing war and then a semblance of religious toleration. To this day, just so you know, um, Switzerland is, 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 is part Catholic and part Protestant. Now, Calvin will follow Zwingli. Calvin and Zwingli didn't disagree on too many things. Uh, Zwingli said that the Eucharist was completely symbolic. Uh, Calvin uh, said perhaps the essence is there. Uh, Calvin's biggest introduction was his idea, as I said before, of predestination and the elect. Calvin, a Protestant, certainly, um, his message begins to spread. His message, much more than Zwingli, spreads. It spreads to many pockets of France. You can see everything pink here is Calvinism. It's taken hold in Switzerland. It's also taken hold in many parts of Germany. Up here in modern day uh, Netherlands, it has taken hold. It will also take hold Calvinism in Scotland. And many English Protestants will come to adopt uh, Calvinism. In fact, um, I'm sure you've heard of the Puritans, right, uh, who come to the colonies in large numbers as refugees uh, from their own persecutions from the English crown. Puritans were essentially Calvinists. They were essentially Calvinists. Now, this is Europe of the late 1500s. We see giant pockets of France under Calvinism, the Netherlands under Calvinism, Scotland under Calvinism. Lutheranism is still growing. The Catholic Church uh, needs to make decisions now. Is she going to lose all of Europe? In our next lesson, we're going to look at France. We're going to look at France and its reformation and its wars of religion. Um, until that time, beautiful people, thank you all very, very much.